this isn't happening. A toddler falls down a well. Somebody said there was water in it. Head first. From all practical purposes, he was dead. Watch the miracle that wowed the medics. Unexplainable. Plus, the queen of Christian fiction. Best-selling storyteller Karen Kingsbury joins us live and takes us inside her latest heartwarming novel, A Baxter Family Christmas, on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The media keeps up its relentless beating of the president-elect. You know, they are just unbelievable. And the big thing now is, well, uh, the other guys got a majority of the votes. But the truth is, Mr. Trump did not campaign in California. He did not campaign in New York. He only campaigned in battleground states, which were important in the uh, general election. Um, consequently, the huge margins that came in uh, didn't really reflect any kind of a contest. Uh, but nevertheless, it looks like that, that uh, concept that was set up for us with an electoral college by our founders was pretty smart. Yeah. Well, the crazy mm. thing about all of these yeah. protests is the man hasn't done anything yet. Well, that's <laughs> right. But they, they just beat him up. I mean, he goes, yeah. to, he goes to eat dinner at 21, uh, which is a nice restaurant, I might add. Um, we had a number of people who apparently watched the 700 Club who were working in 21, and they were very friendly. Well, I, I hope that his skin is tough enough to kind of, of take course all it's of this. Tough. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's a grain of salt. He's tough as nails. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we've got somebody that, that had a vision. He's, he's, he was in Israel, had a vision of what God told him about Trump. We'll tell you that on this program. But he's now having his first face-to-face -face meeting with a major foreign leader. Uh, as president-elect, uh, he's going to talk with the primary of Japan, Shinzo Abe, and it's uh, happening as the Trump team is still reviewing a wide list of names for his cabinet. And on Capitol Hill, Democrats have put together a new leadership team in the Senate that includes some very liberal members. Dale Hurd has the story. It's only been a little more than a week since Donald Trump was elected, and the Japanese prime minister has already flown to New York to meet with the president-elect. Trump vowed during the campaign that allies like Japan should pay more for defense. And Shinzo Abe may be looking for assurances that Trump will remain committed to the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. Meanwhile, the U.S. media, which was wrong about who would win the election, continues to pound the message that the Trump transition is in disarray. I think there is some confusion going on uh, about a chain of command coming out of New York. Even though previous White House transition teams have taken longer to name cabinet appointments. The beginning of any transition like this has turmoil because it's just the nature of the process. And uh, I think that uh, Trump is very decisive. And there are new names to add to the list of possible Trump administration cabinet members. Trump will meet today with South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who is reported to be under consideration for Secretary of State. And the Wall Street Journal reports former Texas Governor Rick Perry is under consideration for Energy Secretary. On Capitol Hill, Senate Republicans re-elected Mitch McConnell as Majority Leader, while Democrats, as expected, chose New York Senator Chuck Schumer as their new leader. Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts and Bernie Sanders of Vermont, both heroes of the far left, also got leadership positions. The new Trump administration is already being challenged by several cities and college campuses over illegal immigration and Trump's campaign promise to deport illegals. Democratic mayors like Chicago's Rahm Emanuel have vowed to defy the federal government and remain sanctuary cities. College students across the country are also demanding that their schools be converted into sanctuary campuses. I am undocumented and I am not afraid. It is very important for me to have a sanctuary campus. But without question, one of Trump's top priorities as soon as he takes office will be to get rid of some of the laws and regulations from the Obama administration. That includes the Clean Power Plan, a measure to fight global warming which critics say hurts parts of the energy industry. The clean water rule, which puts even small bodies of water like wetlands and ponds under control of the federal government. Rules regulating fracking for oil. And the Dodd-Frank regulations of the financial industry, which critics say has slowed down the economy. 
It's all part of a big agenda awaiting President Trump and his administration when he takes office in January. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. It's interesting. You know, Nikki Haley is a wonderful person. I can't see her as Secretary of State, but in terms of heading up the HHS, it would be tremendous. She would do a great job, as would Bobby Jindal. Uh, both of them have uh, Hindu roots uh, in, in their background, and both are dedicated born-again Christians. So they, they'd be uh, tremendous picks. Um, but what people have to realize is that heading a major government agency that has hundreds of thousands of employees and billions of dollars of, uh, of uh, procurement involved, this takes somebody who has business experience. And you just don't put some nice senator in there or whatever and think they're going to know what to do. They don't because they've never been faced with that kind of challenges. But I, I think that we'll see a good team coming out. But some of these uh, kids, you know, I was told that uh, they're giving them now milk and cookies in colleges to quiet them down and having little toys, little, little things that they can have, little fluffy toys to play. I mean, these are college students, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Well, you know, I, so many times yeah. we've seen people interviewed on the street, not just by our reporters, yeah, yeah. but by others. And they're unknowledgeable about who the people in positions of, of authority are. Sometimes I think when you're at that stage of life, you're just looking for a cause. You know? Well, I'm, I mean, a cause by all means, but this, this is absolutely absurd. They don't know what they're doing. And uh, uh, the idea is that this country would be wide open to the invasion of anybody who wants to come here. And once they're here, the uh, working class of this nation have to supply them with uh, food and clothes and shelter and uh, uh, education and all the other perks that go along with citizenship. This is just insane. No country would have to do that, but that's what these young kids want. And the idea of sanctuary, uh, can you imagine how it was in the civil rights era when certain uh, governors stood up against the federal government and said, we are going to maintain our Jim Crow laws, we're going to maintain racial disparity, and the federal government went in and moved against them and to stop that. And I think sooner or later, there's got to be a coming to reckoning with these guys who act like they're such big heroes. But we can't have little enclaves of illegal immigrants in various cities across the country. The, the immigration policy is in the federal government. We want as much as we can to have local control of our politics. It's much better. And to decentralize is a wonderful thing. But in terms of immigration, we have to have a unified policy. Just that simple. And. Uh, that these guys, uh, de Blasio and the mayor of uh, Rahm Emanuel in Chicago and others, I mean, they're just grandstanding. It's ridiculous. But uh, sooner or later, they're going to have a reckoning. But what Trump says right now, I want to take people who are criminals, people who break the law, and I want to send them out of this country. Well, what's such a big deal about that? Why is that so cruel? Well, stocks have climbed sharply since Trump was elected. But another investment has also been rising. John Jessup has that. That's right, Pat. The dollar hit its highest level in nearly 14 years Wednesday against a basket of foreign currencies. The dollar has been climbing since Trump's election, partly because of the belief interest rates could rise under his administration, as some analysts expect his policies will help the economy grow. Although some believe the dollar rally will slow down for a while, many traders believe it will keep getting stronger over time. Well, Trump's election stunned most of the political world, but some prayer leaders in the church believe they saw it coming. As Chris Mitchell reports, some have compared him to Cyrus, an important secular king who played a key role with Israel in Old Testament times. Author and speaker Lance Wallnau met Donald Trump several months before the election. I had the strangest sense that I was dealing with something different. I was dealing with someone who wasn't an evangelical Christian who was anointed for an assignment. And I didn't know what, where to go with that. Delivered. So I went home and all that I heard the Lord say is, Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. Wall now compared Trump to the Persian King Cyrus cited in the Bible. Cyrus decreed the Jews living in captivity in ancient Babylon could return to Israel and rebuild their temple. He came in, this king, as a secular ruler and decreed for the building of the house of the Lord. He literally made it possible for the Jews to end the captivity. 
And I'm reading on, it says, like, you know, he will break through the two leaves gates of Babylon. I'm going, well, there's your wrecking ball. He says history is filled with secular rulers appointed by God for unique seasons. He anoints them for their assignment. And then it's obvious if you think about it. You're stuck with the reality of history. Does God put people into the crucible of history who are not your favorite Christian candidate, but who in the end was perfectly anointed for the test? Walno also believes Trump's idea of a wall to protect America has a biblical parallel. I feel the whole emphasis on building a wall really is building again in America the capacity for self-government. We have no government over our sexual propensities. We have no government over our fiscal appetite. We have no government over our relations between uh, police and minorities. We, we're a nation that is radically losing its ability for self-government, and with that comes the privileges of self-government. So the wall that Trump's talking about is a metaphor like Nehemiah. We have to rebuild moral self-control and self-restraint. He thinks the dangerous world of today needs a strong leader, and he believes Trump can guide America through international storms. And he points out Trump has forged a unique relationship with Christians. Trump, for some strange reason, loves evangelicals. I mean, it's, it's peculiar. He has more confidence in what Christians can do in America than Christians have in what Christians can do. And he sees them as a missing piece. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Well, the world's earliest known complete stone inscription of the Ten Commandments has been sold at an auction in Beverly Hills for $850,000. The two-foot square marble slab weighs about 115 pounds, and it lists nine of the ten commonly known, commonly known commandments. The tablet, tablet probably adorned the entrance of a synagogue destroyed by the Romans between 400 and 600 A.D. or by the Crusaders in the 11th century. It's been called a national treasure in Israel, and the winning bidder does not wish to be identified. The only condition for the sale is that it will be displayed in a public museum. And Pat, I read that the bidding started at a cool quarter of a million dollars. Well, I would think it's priceless. It'd be worth a whole lot more than that, frankly, but uh, I'm glad it's going to be, I, I presume, kept in Israel in a museum. Mm -hmm. But um, this is, you know, God moved down, came to Sinai, and met with the people, and he said, here's what I want you to do. And first of all, don't have any other gods before me. I'm going to look after you. I'm the Lord your God that brought you out of captivity. And when you read the Ten Commandments, and you, I wrote a book on the Ten Commandments, they are really to preserve the peace that people have, peace in their lives, peace in their possessions, peace in their marriages, and peace in their, in their uh, uh, identity. I mean, it's, it's what, do you read it? That's what it's about, It's to give us peace of mind and peace of heart to live in a peaceful society. And that's what God wants. But when you begin to say, the one thing you don't do is mess with my name, because the name of God is He who causes everything to be. And He said, that is His identity, and that you don't take for vanity. So it, it, it's a great document, and it's priceless. There's, there's no amount of money you could place on the truth that's in that uh, document. Yeah, I too was surprised that the, the price was so low. <laughs> well, I, I think it is too, Terry. It really does. I mean, they've got some ugly piece of art that some guy slapped, you know, uh, some junk on, and they bring that, you know, twenty or thirty million dollars. Yes, exactly. Well, I, actually, uh, one was a half a million, but Pollard, they, they, uh, Pollock, they, they had, they had two of his paintings that brought for five hundred million dollars. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's just terrible. I mean, this, this is the Ten Commandments. Exactly. Okay. Well, coming up, a look at the origin of ISIS. One of the worst things that happened after we invaded Iraq and uh, handled the surge and President Obama effectively pulled out very quickly and left things in chaos. See how the terrorist group has grown in strength and influence and what we must do to stop it. Well, the Iraqi and coalition forces are moving in on Mosul to drive the ISIS fighters out. Chances are, if Trump's right, the leadership has already long since gone and moved into Raqqa in Syria. But for three years, the Islamic terrorists of ISIS have brought death and destruction to the Middle East. They've committed genocide against Christians and Yazidis, and they've unleashed terror on the world. Well. 
I asked our team to go back and look at the history of how this group got started. It's very interesting. And first of all, how do we identify it? And then how do we defeat it? Gary Lane brings us this look at the origins of ISIS. Church bells ring in celebration as Iraqi Christians return home. For nearly two and a half years, many of them have lived as refugees in Kurdistan since ISIS overran their villages when it seized Mosul. The fight to liberate Mosul from ISIS control is expected to take months, but it's taken years for the terrorist group to get to this point. Before ISIS was as strong as it is today, it was a network of Islamic extremists known as Al-Tahid al-Jihad, and it was led by this man, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Zarqawi was a Jordanian-born Bedouin of Palestinian heritage. He was an illiterate petty criminal. In 1992, the Jordanian government sent him to jail after guns and explosives were found in his home. There he became radicalized and attempted to enlist fellow prisoners in a plot to overthrow the Jordanian monarchy. To the best of my knowledge, he wasn't on anybody's uh, radar. That was about uh, three years before uh, 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 things really got going with, uh, with al-Qaeda. After his release from prison, El Zarqawi set up a terrorist training camp in Herat, Afghanistan. By the middle of 2002, the CIA suspected him of establishing a similar camp and a poison gas lab in northern Iraq, in a town called Kermal. In March 2003, Zarqawi survived a U.S. airstrike on the camp. Then he moved farther south. After the United States disbanded Saddam's army, Zarqawi enlisted help from some of the former Iraqi officers and operatives. And then Zarqawi's band of Sunni Muslims launched an insurgency against U.S. troops, Shiites and others. El Zarqawi became the symbol of the Sunni resistance, and other extremists followed his example, carrying out many more attacks. In January 2004, the U.S. reportedly intercepted a letter from Zarqawi to the al-Qaeda leadership, saying the best way to defeat the United States in Iraq is to incite a sectarian war among Muslims that will, quote, awaken the sleepy Sunnis. Some people in and out of government doubted the authenticity of that letter, Regardless, in October 2004, El Zarqawi pledged allegiance to Osama bin Laden. He became the leader of Al-Qaeda Iraq. In March 2004, U.S. contractor Nick Berg was beheaded on video. The CIA said Berg's executioner was none other than Abu Musab El Zarqawi. In June 2006, Zarqawi was tracked down and killed by a U.S. airstrike. Following Zarqawi's death, Al-Qaeda Iraq morphed into the Islamic State, and quiet cleric Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi became its leader. After President Obama announced all U.S. troops would be removed from Iraq by the end of 2011, al-Baghdadi and the Islamic State of Iraq moved into action. They launched a wave of deadly explosives and car bomb attacks in Mosul and Baghdad. One of the worst things that happened uh, was that uh, we, uh, after we invaded uh, Iraq uh, and uh, handled the surge and were in pretty good shape, President Obama uh, effectively pulled out very quickly and left things in chaos. In April 2013, Baghdadi announced his group would expand into Syria. And so the Islamic State in Iraq became ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. By December 2014, ISIS had fielded more than 30,000 jihadists and occupied territory in one-third of Iraq and one-quarter of Syria. In January of 2014, President Obama compared ISIS to a JV team. Former CIA Director Woolsey is critical of how U.S. intelligence facts about ISIS were altered to fit a political narrative. Well, this administration starts uh, with... Uh, 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 a uh, narrative, as they call it, a story, and then they try to fiddle around with the facts to make them fit the narrative, rather than changing the narrative to match the real facts. And uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that um, uh, ISIS has, uh, has grown in importance. So how can the United States defeat ISIS? Former CIA analyst Fred Flight says, the U.S. and Russian air campaign alone will not do it. We know from history you can't win wars from the air. But even if we wiped out ISIS on the ground, it's the ideology that has to be fought. Also, the ISIS money supply must be choked off. It's a terrorist organization that holds territory. It is able to generate money from oil 
It's able to generate money from illegal trade, and it probably has supporters from Gulf states, Gulf states who support uh, these radical jihadists, the same people who have been supporting al-Qaeda over the years. The Sunni Grand Mufti of Syria agrees. When I met Sheikh Hassan in Damascus earlier this year, I asked what would it take to defeat ISIS and end the civil war in Syria? All religions must come together and see where this financing is coming from for these extremists and stop it. Many Muslim leaders, they have connections and their wealth is related to the fighting. They are financing it. Recent leaks of Hillary Clinton emails by WikiLeaks show the former Secretary of State knew who was funding the Islamic State. In this August 2014 communication with her campaign chairman John Podesta, Clinton says, we need to use our diplomatic and more traditional intelligence assets to bring pressure on the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which are providing clandestine financial and logistic support to ISIL and other radical Sunni groups in the region. And the war against ISIS will not end with the liberation of Mosul. It has become uh, a powerful organization, a lethal organization, and one that's going to take a, a fair amount of fighting uh, to destroy in its uh, home court, so to speak, in Syria and Iraq. And then uh, it also has to be uh, uh, defeated uh, in all of our uh, uh, cities and states and neighborhoods uh, in the U.S. and uh, elsewhere. We cannot just uh, ignore it. It's going to get worse. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's, I, I wanted to get that before you to understand where it came from, where it started, and how it's metastasized like a cancer. Uh, but the death toll from ISIS is just appalling. The beheadings and the rapes and all the rest of the thing, taking those Yazidi women as slaves and sex slaves. I mean, it's just hideous what they've done. They're, they're butchers. And uh, it's amazing. One penniless Bedouin, in a sense, who made part of his living, I might add, as being a pimp, suddenly has a revelation. And out of that revelation comes this new caliphate. And now Baghdadi is, is, has announced himself as the caliph. He stood up and said, I'm the new caliph. I'm in charge of the caliphate. And they want a crescent that goes all the way from Iran all the way to the Mediterranean uh, as their territory. So it's going to take some work to do it, but the thing that is so amazing is that the United States has taken from its training manual of the FBI, this is the actual fact, they've taken a thousand pages out that dealt with Muslim extremism. The FBI agents cannot be taught about it, nor can they mention the fact. And when you look at the, the problems that are facing the world, we have been muzzled. Our defenses have been muzzled in this nation. We cannot say anything unkind about Islam. Well, Islam is where ISIS comes from. It springs out of Islamic thought. And so what uh, uh, Mr. Woolsey, uh, Woolsey said, we've also got to take care of the ideology behind ISIS or we can't win it. Terry? Well, up next, a first responder arrives on the scene where a toddler has fallen head first into an abandoned well. It was blue. There was nothing on the monitor, no showing no heart activity. He was not breathing on his own. In all practical purposes, he was dead. Stay tuned to see how this tragedy turns into a miracle. It only takes a moment, just a blink of the eyes, for your entire world to turn upside down. And that's exactly what happened to the Jackson family after their toddler disappeared, only to be found face down at the bottom of a well. It's it, everything you've ever thought of at your worst moment in your life. You're just praying that this is a dream. This isn't happening. On May 21st, 2008, Bruce and Kelly Jackson's 22-month-old son, Eric, wandered away from the playground at a local Mother's Day Out program. Before caregivers noticed he was missing, Eric fell headfirst into a six-and-a-half-foot abandoned well. But then I said, well, there wasn't water in it, was there? And they said, could you just meet us at the ER? At this point, you know, I realize, 
somebody said there was water in it. We arrived on the scene. We were presented the child by the staff there. I do not know how long without oxygen, but from our indicators, from what we look for, um, he was cyanotic, he was blue. He, it, there was nothing on the uh, the monitor, no showing no heart activity, was not breathing on his own. And all practical purposes, he was dead. First responders immediately started CPR and Eric was rushed to the nearest hospital. But they said they needed me to go back and see him, that if I wanted to see him, it probably needed to be right now. And I thought, what do you mean? Then it kind of started hitting me. And then I was like, no, I'm not going back without Bruce. We went over and um, um, held his hand. And um, he didn't seem recognizable. He wasn't, he wasn't a little boy we saw that morning. And um, <clears throat> they were still doing everything they could. But after 90 minutes of CPR and without any additional medical intervention, Eric's condition changed suddenly. And they came running outside and said his heart is beating again. Miraculous is a word, unbelievable. Uh, in my 25 years, never seen before, unexplainable. Still in critical condition, Eric was life flighted to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. They told us that his uh, kidneys had shut down, um, that his lungs were damaged, that his liver was shutting down, um, his uh, internal organs were failing. Um, they didn't know the extent of the brain, brain damage. And they said, if he makes it through the night, we'll talk tomorrow. My prayers were. I wasn't sure if he was going to be okay, but I knew that um, I just needed God's strength, whether he made it or he didn't, but I kind of really didn't think he was. As news of Eric's accident spread, people all over the world were praying for him. Our church during that time period was just amazing, overwhelming. I just, I couldn't believe it. At this point, uh, there were it had to have been thousands of people praying for us. You just felt the love and the concern, and I, I haven't experienced anything like that in my life. Eric was on life support and in a coma. After one week, due to his lack of progress, doctors scheduled a meeting with Bruce and Kelly. He was on, you know, breathing machines and, and all the necessary equipment to keep him alive. They were gathering all the specialists, and uh, we were supposed to meet that afternoon but the Jacksons never had that conference with the doctors. Before the meeting, that's when um, one of the nurses ran in and said that he was awake. <laughs> um, as, it, as exciting as it was when he was born, that was even better. It was just an amazing experience. And when, I, when you talk to a medical professional, that that's what they do and they see and they see so many other things and they're just like, this is amazing. This is miraculous. In the months to follow, Eric had to undergo extensive physical therapy to learn how to walk, talk and eat again. So you could see the delays in certain areas, but that gap just kept getting narrower, more and more narrow. Today, Eric has no residual effects from the accident and is a bright and healthy eight year old. He's just funny. I think he's just smart and sweet, and I think he's a good friend, and I think he's, uh, you know, I'm his mom, so I think he's just great. <laughs> if you saw him, you would never know that anything had happened. Every day, he's just, uh, he, he does uh, the things that you would expect a normal boy to do. The Jacksons say they pray Eric's experience will bring hope to hurting families. My relationship with Christ is just kind of put the exclamation point on it. He didn't fail me. Couldn't have made it without him. I think just trusting and believing that he, he's got a plan. Rely well, on your faith. He's good, and uh, he's going to be there with you. He is a good, good father, and he is going to be there with you, too. I know many of you have needs, and you'd love to be prayed for today, and we're going to do just that. But we want to build your faith even more by sharing some reports that we've received. Well, you here's have one, one that came in from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, this lady. Um, April was diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy, which caused bleeding and pressure behind her eyes, affected her vision. So she thought she was losing her eyes. Mm. And on September the, the 20th, April was watching the 700 Club. Terry gave this word of knowledge 
someone you have bleeding behind your eye, and you are so faithful that you're losing your vision. And God is healing that for you right now. April said, that's me. I received the word. And guess what? Her vision is yeah, spared. completely healed. Completely Wonderful. Healed. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, this is Joyce. She lives in uh, Lampasas, Texas. She had pain in her shoulder for four years. She was diagnosed with a torn rotator cuff, but she didn't want to have surgery. Well, last September, she was watching this program, had her hand on her shoulder because it was causing her a lot of pain. And Pat, you said, you've got a torn shoulder and God has just set you free right now. Put your hand on your shoulder. You are healed in the name of Jesus. She said she felt the pain leave her shoulder. She has not had any pain since then. A torn rotator cuff. That's pretty serious. Folks, there's no limit to God's power. That's so, so wonderful. He deals with nations. Yeah. He deals with armies. He deals with navies. He deals with air forces. But he also deals with people. The lowest person in society's rungs still is a child of God and can call upon the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to have a graduate degree. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have anything except faith in Jesus. Now we're going to pray. Terry and I will join hands right now. And we're going to pray for you. Father, I reach out to those in this audience. We thank you for the testimonies of faith, the testimonies of healing, the wonderful miracles that we're seeing. In the name of Jesus, Somebody has bladder cancer, and the Lord is just, it'll, you'll feel like fire right now in your intestine. It'll look like it'll be burning right this minute, and you're healed. Terry? Someone else, you've been, your house has been broken into, and a lot of your goods have been taken, and you are so filled with fear. Right now, fear be gone in Jesus' name. Reach up your hands and just receive the trust and the joy of the Lord. God has just sealed that in your heart, and that fear is gone. Uh, somebody, you've got what's called a tick delivery uh, in your face. Uh, is the jumping in a tick that's there. And just put your hand on that part of your face that's having that problem in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Touch. And someone else with yeah. shingles all around your midsection. Oh, it's so hard for you even to just put yeah. normal day-to-day -day clothing on. God is healing that condition for you. You won't even have scarring from it. Throughout this audience, let the anointing be there. And we pray for our president-elect and his team. Give them wisdom, Lord. Give them unusual wisdom from on high that they might pick the leadership of their team that we need to govern this land. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Okay. Well, coming up, she yes. is the queen of Christian fiction with 25 million books in print. Karen Kingsbury joins us live to talk about her latest holiday novel. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Duck Dynasty fans will say goodbye to the Robertson family. They announced on last night's premiere episode of the 11th season, they and the A&E Network have agreed to end the reality series. I had the chance to sit down with Duck Commander CEO Willie Robertson in New York City earlier this week, and we'll bring you a full report right here on the 700 Club very soon. The five-year-old show will air new episodes through the spring with the final episode coming in March or April. But as one series ends, a new network begins. Actress Roma Downey and her husband, producer Mark Burnett, are set to launch a new family and faith TV network. Light TV will start next month on more than a dozen major broadcast outlets. The 24-hour network will feature wholesome family and faith-based films, as well as television series. The couple, known for producing two Bible-based miniseries and the film Son of God, say there is a large demand for family-friendly entertainment. The Round the Clock Network will feature dramas like Highway to Heaven and films like Rocky and Fame. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this.
you don't have to look far to know the holiday season is here. And for those who love cooking and baking, we've got a great deal for you. Just visit facebook.com slash 700 club and submit your favorite recipe for our holiday contest. The winner's recipe will be featured right here on the 700 club next Wednesday, November 23rd. So you need to hurry on over to Facebook and post your recipe. You could be our winner. Can't wait to see what you have to share. So do that today. Well, speaking of holidays, best-selling author Karen Kingsbury has released a new novel with the holiday theme. It centers around her best-loved characters, the Baxters, whom she modeled after her real family. Take a look. She's known as the queen of Christian fiction. With over 25 million books in print and millions of fans around the world, Karen Kingsbury lives up to the title. Some of her heartwarming stories have even been adapted to the big screen. Karen's latest book, A Baxter Family Christmas, focuses around her most popular characters, the Baxters, as they come together after tragedy and witness a Christmas miracle. Well, Karen is right here with us now. You have written 23 books about the Baxter family. Yes. What's their appeal, do you think? I think it's the family that everyone's had or the family they never Everybody had. Everybody wants. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You say that your work is life-changing fiction. What do you mean by that, Karen? I got that word from readers. They would write to me and I would say, okay, my books might make you cry and you know, really engage you, but the letters from readers really made me cry. Wow. And they would write and they would say, now that I read your book, I'm ready to love my husband better wow. or make amends with a sister that I've been estranged from. So it was, he it was God using the power of story to heal relationships. And you know, I always say, Jesus, he could tell you straight. I was just going to say, it's been from the very yep. first, hasn't it? Yep. He could turn over a table or he could, if he wanted to touch your heart, he would tell a story. Yes, exactly. You started out as a sportscaster. How did you <laughs> go from that to author? Well, you know, that was a funny thing, but I think in a sense, it's all the same in the way that you tell a story. So when I was doing sports, I did the feature stories. Might have been a hundred year old woman running a marathon in the memory uh -huh. of her husband. I mean, she didn't finish it, but dedicated to doing, you know, just the heartfelt stories, which sports has a lot of those. Yes. So I started off there, but my, my hope and my prayer was always that I could write fiction and that there would be stories that would change people. And obviously that's happening with the response that you're getting. I'm elated to know you're also a supporter of adoption. You're an adoptive mom. Tell us about your family. In 2001, we adopted three little boys from Haiti and they were best friends. They were not um, How wonderful. biologically related until now, now they're, now they're brothers. <laughs> and so it's been a while and you know, you set out to bless them, but ultimately they have blessed yeah. us beyond words. Yeah, God's always in the process of molding and refining all of yeah, us, isn't he? That's really true. Yeah, that's really that's really awesome. In 2002, we adopted three girls from Ukraine. They were biologically related, mm. but it's life changing. It, it really, is. Really, really and is. now our kids are funny. They all a lot of them are into writing or into acting. Really? And so some of our kids we brought home from Haiti, they're like, now mom, when the Baxter family is on TV, <laughs> you know, next year. So Roma Downey and Mark Burnett, their, their new network that they're starting light, that's going to be one of the first original wow. um, TV shows on their network, the Baxter family next year. How fabulous, yeah. how perfect, yeah, really. Exactly. So the Baxters could continue in the lives of your children, right? That's right. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about <clears throat> your latest novel. You know, when people think of the holidays, I think family is a theme that runs through that for most of us, either that we have or that we want. Tell us about what we can expect here. Well, a Baxter family Christmas is the first time that we have been with the Baxters at Christmas. So this is a special uh, chance for the readers to see that. It's also a great beginning. So if you've never been with the Baxter family, you want to know what you this TV series is about, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and pick it up. And this is a great starting point. So here we have a situation where the Baxters are a few years removed from a really, really bad tragedy that's happened to their family. Mm -hmm. And now they're ready to laugh again and celebrate again. And John Baxter, the patriarch, wants to invite a stranger for Christmas dinner. Ah. And the stranger is this woman who has the heart of John's daughter, Erin. Yep. And so they want, he wants to bring her in for Christmas dinner. Not everyone agrees. There's some conflict there, but ultimately, especially at Christmas time, it's so important that we make amends. We say, look, I love you. I'm sorry. Bill Let's start Bridges. again. Yep. That's right. <clears throat> it's a perfect opportunity to do that. Excuse me. <clears throat> what
do you think of when you like now, and now you've got the Baxter family Christmas. I'm sure you're already at work on on the next piece. What goes into the the just the creation and the the pull, pulling together and the emphasis of all of that? Well, for me, it's always got to have an outline first. Mm -hmm. So I start with an idea, sort of something that's going to move me or, or touch my heart. So the next one's called Love Story, ah. and it will be out in June. And it's really the story of John and Elizabeth Baxter, the, the main, you know, the couple that started it all. We've never gotten to see their love story. And then I outline and I make sure that I've got every chapter accounted for in terms of whose really? point of view it is and what's happening. Wow. And if I love the outline, then I know I'm ready to write. <laughs> With six kids, you know, I don't have yes. a lot of time to mess around. So I have got to get my, my uh, outline right and then get that book written. So once you do something like that, like you, it sounds like you've already done all of that for Love Story, how long does it take you from the time you start writing until the time it's in book form? If, I, well, that's supposed to be a year. Generally, they want to, you know, you, you should be writing it and have it in the first draft by a year before it's going to be on show. So I'm actually working right now on the one that's going to be out in November next Good year. Grief. Already, which is kind of a, you know, the process overlaps. So you have the writing, that's one thing, but then you have your editing phases and the marketing. And then as it comes out, I just got off tour for a Baxter Family Christmas. So you're always working on, you know, some aspects of still three books, road. really. Well, yeah. and with this new television opportunity, I suppose that will happen even more. It will. I mean, we're excited. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning, to the book Redemption. That's where the all Baxters right. began. And uh, the very first season will be Redemption and Remember, just the first two books. So we have about 10 years of material, and Roma feels like this is going to be what the Waltons was or yes. a Gilmore Girls or just one of those series that really catches the hearts of America. Well, so does A Baxter Family Christmas. If you've read all 22 of the Baxter books or if you're new to this series, be sure to pick up a copy. What a great Christmas gift for someone. If you'd like to hear more from Karen Kingsbury, go to facebook.com slash 700 club. We have an exclusive interview with the queen of Christian fiction. How wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Look Jerry. forward to more books and more television. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, still ahead, we're going to bring it on with this email question from a viewer named Anne. My husband is friends with his old girlfriends and meets them for coffee. I'm not comfortable with this. What can I do? I'm sure Pat's got an answer for that. We'll be hearing it. It's coming up. <laughs> Hey, you're watching the 700 Club. We've got a bunch of questions that you've sent in of uh, intriguing things. But before we get to that, I want to introduce you to the Ja family. Those folks lived in fear because of where they lived. But today they can rest easily at night thanks to what you did. Every time there was a storm, NC ran straight into her father's arms. I was afraid of the thunder, and I was really scared that the old shack we lived in was going to fall down on us any second. Mr. Ja always comforted his daughter, but both he and his elderly mother knew their home was dangerous because of the structure and the mice. The shack was almost 40 years old, and it was built of dirt. So there were lots of holes in the walls. And when it rained, the water came straight through. If the shack collapsed, we would all be buried by it. I got sick really easily because of that house. One time, my mother was unconscious. Her face was yellow. She could hardly breathe, and she couldn't talk. I was so afraid that my grandmother was going to die there, and I'd never see her again. Grandma Ja recovered, but after that close call, Mr. Ja tried to fix things. I hated to see my daughter and my mother suffering, so I heated up some tar to patch the cracks. But soon the walls started leaking again. I knew I needed to rebuild my house. Mr. Ja only makes $100 a month, so he couldn't rebuild. But he and his mother are Christians, so they prayed for help. We said, Lord, you know our situation, our needs. Please provide for us. Somehow help me to build a new house. Please give us a miracle. Then CBN heard about the Jaws, and we helped them build a brand new brick house. 
my problem was solved through the help of God's children, and it's such a relief. Every time I see our new house, I am so happy. My mother will not get wet or sick, and there will be no problems in the rain or even the snow. I like my new house very much, and now I feel very safe. God heard our cries. Thank you, CBN. Thank you, God. It's all grace. Just imagine living in that shack uh, with the wind blowing in, and it gets cold over there. I mean, cold. I remember when I was stationed in Japan, and they had those little, you know, flimsy houses, and it was freezing cold. They had little charcoal braziers in the center of a room, and, and it was just terribly cold. They didn't have wonderful heating like we do. And uh, you think of the suffering they have. It doesn't take much to give somebody happiness and give them a chance of life. And so we're able to do that around the world to help people. In your name, we help them. So what does it take to help us help them? 65 cents a day. It's not a lot. $20 a month. That's all it takes. You can be a 700 Club member. You can do a lot more if you want to. But uh, it doesn't take much. And for those that do, I want to send you this. I really, 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 really think this is something that's important. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm not like Karen Kingsbury who writes stuff. I, I didn't write this, but I sure <laughs> did like it. It's the Gospel of John, modern version, new uh, international uh, version. And uh, uh, it'll bless you. So we'll give you this when you join the 700 Club. All right. This is Larry who lives in Cadet, Missouri, and he's already received his copy. He says, by listening to the Gospel of John, I received a deeper, more intimate understanding as to who Jesus is. Very inspirational. Thank you. I will follow him. Wow, that's you know, a testimony. Over and over again. You know, it used to be we got letters from women, which we think are great, but so many men are responding to this particular Thing. It's the Gospel of John is touching these guys. And for that, I am very grateful. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, join the 700 Club. Yeah, let's kick some questions. Okay, let's bring it on. You ready? This right. first question comes from Anne, who says, My husband and I are on our second marriages and have not been married long. My husband is friends with his old girlfriends and meets them for coffee. I've tried to tell him I'm not comfortable with this. My first husband cheated on me. He says, I'm insecure and it's my problem. I pray to God to intercede, but he hasn't. I'm so alone in this and don't know what to do. Is this behavior of his okay and am I just insecure? I don't want to push him away or into another woman's arms. What can I do? All right, you're married the second time. You didn't tell me what grounds you had for getting divorced the first time. Uh, whether the one you are in bond Well, she in. was cheated on, she said. So. Yeah, but you don't know. Uh, in any event, uh, Look, this is a spiritual bond. He's, he's having a spiritual connection. Is it adultery? Well, they're not having physical sex with these ladies, but uh, he's out there and he's drawing close to them and he's sharing intimate moments that he should be sharing with you. And no, it's not all right. It's not like a working relationship where men and women work together. It's just a different deal. Uh, they have coffee and they're chatting together and sharing the intimate secrets. You have an absolute right as a wife to say no. Uh, that's not appropriate. I will not stand up for it. And, you know, if, if he won't go along with it, you, you have an absolute right, in my opinion, to say this marriage isn't working. I'm out of here. But uh, do everything you can to hold it together. But again, it's your second marriage, and I don't know what happened to marriage number one. All right. Okay, this is Chris who says, I gave myself to the Lord 19 years ago. I left church when I was 23. I had three children out of wedlock, suffered domestic violence, and was left with three special needs children to raise. I moved to New York City, from New York City to Philadelphia and met a young man who said he was a Christian. Turns out he wasn't, but I had already fallen in love with him. We've been on and off for two years, and the last time he came back, we slept together. I'm now six weeks pregnant. I know that I'm in sin. I want to keep going to church church, but I'm afraid I'll just start the cycle all over again. How can I fix this? You know, the story in the Bible that Jesus met a woman out by a well. She was a Samaritan woman. And uh, he said, go call your husband. And she said, well, uh, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. The man you're living with, you've had five husbands. The guy you're living with isn't your husband. 
Um, but you know something? He unfolded to her some of the deepest truths that are revealed in the Bible. And uh, she was a, from a despised race, living in sin, but Jesus had compassion on her. He has compassion on you, but listen, the lifestyle you're living, uh, you've just got to stop. How do you do it? You've got to come to him and say, I ask your forgiveness. I have done wrong. I have sinned against you, and I ask your forgiveness, and he'll do it. But you've got to, you just can't keep on doing this. This is irresponsible. I know you, 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 I think as a woman, you feel that you're not worthy, you're not a treasure, and you throw yourself away at these guys. And you can't do it anymore. You've got to realize you're special in God's eyes. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from the Psalms. As far as the East is from the West, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.